Thank you. How are you doing this morning? We're going to go through uh, some questions that I get from skeptics and scoffers. I call them scoptics. That's kind of how I feel when I get some of those questions, by the way. And, um, you know, these are questions I get from well-meaning people, too, because they've been planted in our minds. Now, Satan is really good at what he does. Don't ever underestimate Satan. He's an expert at what he does. And what he wants to do is to plant seeds of doubt with people. In fact, the first question posed in the Bible is in Genesis 3, verse 1, where Satan, Lucifer, is in the garden, and he asks the first question, Hath God said, and starts planting seeds of doubt? He does that through questions. Well, the Bible tells us to be ready always to give an answer to every man with meekness and with fear. So let's look at some common questions and some answers to those skeptical uh, questions that put seeds of doubt in people's mind. You know, one of the ones, you may have heard this before, this actually started uh, seriously back in the 1800s, but isn't the Bible just a bunch of legends and myths? You know, we're going to look at some historical verification here. See, the Bible is historically set in a location and in a period of time. And that opens it up to some scientific scrutiny, so it should hold up to what science and archaeology can find. Well, back in the 1800s, 19th century skeptics were denying many of the kings and the nations found in the Bible ever existed. They were also uh, denying there was ever a King David. Well, real science is a believer's best friend, and in the 20th century, the emerging science of archaeology found more than 40 of these kings and nations proving the Bible is reliable historically. In fact, in 2005, Israeli archaeologists found King David's palace. You know, when the Israeli archaeologists made this discovery, they said, what's amazing about the Bible is that it's amazingly accurate. And the Bible is actually used by archaeologists now to roadmap things in the Middle East. It's that accurate. Okay, how about this? Why is the Bible at odds with science? Well, that's what we're told today. You have to realize, Satan is the prince of the air. He's the god of this world. The secular side, run by Satan, they own schools, universities, media, parks. Uh, they pretty much own the system as we should expect in this fallen, sin-rent world. But with regard to uh, science, did you know that of the, of the 200 or so branches of modern science, more than 164 of them were started by Christians? Did you know that? Hey, they don't talk about that today, do they? Yeah, real science always has been and always will be a, a believer's best friend. You see, we thought there's no way to study random chance. There would be no science without Christianity. But we thought, you know, there's an intelligent creator. He probably put some laws and principles in place to govern his creation. And if we would study the creation, we could discover some of those laws and principles and put them into to play in our own lives. That's led to the many great discoveries in real science, a believer's best friend. It's led to, from laptops to radios to space shuttles to penicillin. None of that would exist. We'd still be back in the dark ages if it weren't for Christianity and real science a believer's best friend. For example, at the end of the sixth day of creation, God said the heavens and the earth were finished. He said they were finished. Well, the first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of mass and energy, that matter and or energy cannot be created or destroyed. Matter can be changed to energy, energy can be uh, changed to matter, but the total amount does not change. I think when God said the creation was finished, I think what he meant was that the uh, <clears throat> creation was, was finished. <laughs> Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity shows that the universe is a huge result of something. It's a big result, and it had a beginning. Well, logic holds that for every result, like the universe, that had a beginning, it had to have a cause. But the cause of that result had to exist outside of the result. In other words, the cause of the universe logically has to exist before and be outside of the universe's space, matter, and time. That's just basic logic. Of all ancient religious texts, only the biblical God claimed to exist outside of space, matter, and time. 
making him the only logical creator for the universe. In fact, only the biblical God claimed to be outside of his, his creation and also eternal, everlasting. Well, being eternal without a beginning cause puts only the biblical God outside of the laws of logic, making him the only viable option for the creator of our universe and all life therein. In fact, this Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist stated, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted if I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses. My friends, I know sacralists own the system and they say that if you don't accept their religious-based beliefs, millions of years leading to Darwinism, two beliefs, that you're anti-science, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, we kicked creation and prayer out of our schools in 1963, 56 years ago. From the, from the 1600s, okay, through the 1700s, through the 1800s, all the way through 1962, we had daily prayer to God and taught our kids biblical creation. Now, 50, at that time in 1962, our nation was number one in the world in science, number one in the world in engineering, number one in the world in technology, one, number one in the world in math, number one in the world in education, number one in the world in economy, number one in the world in military power, number one in the world in standard of living, number one, well, I think you get the picture, 1962. Then we kick creation and prayer. We turn our back on God who blessed us so greatly. And for 56 years, we've been teaching our kids they evolved without God. How are we doing? For how many trillions in debt? We've lost all of our manufacturing and all the great jobs with that. Our schools now rank in the bottom 17% in the world. Um, read Romans 1. When you get home today, it's just take you two minutes. Read Romans 1, uh, 15 to 32 and keep 1963 in mind, it will blow you away with the truth of God's word. Well, how do you know the Bible is the word of God? Well, let's look at internal consistency and prophetic accuracy. Internal consistency. If 10 of us witness a car accident at the closest intersection this afternoon, and if three minutes later, police came and, and took our statements, you'd get 10 very different accounts of what had just happened right then, right in front of us. Well, the Bible uh, consists of 66 books written by 40 diff different authors that range from kings and doctors to priests, fishermen, and shepherds. It's written in three different languages in 15 different countries on three diff different continents over a 1,500 plus year period of time, and yet it's one unified account with no contradictions, it'll stand up to true scrutiny, despite what the scoffers and skeptics might have to say. And talk about prophetic accuracy, hundreds and hundreds of prophecies have been made that have already come true. The odds of making 10 prophecies and having 10 come true are beyond uh, astronomical. Hundreds times hundreds, I don't know if you have calculators that, that go that high. Over 90% have already taken place. Many are taking place right now. I'm going to talk about one that has to do with geology and the whole worldview and a battle of worldviews in a minute. But many are taking place right now. I think Israel becoming a nation again in one day. That one just blows me away. Imagine being a Christian a uh, hundred years ago. Just a hundred years ago. That would have been in Israel for 1,800 years. And the Bible keeps talking about Israel in the last days. And all of a sudden, boom, in 1948, uh, there's Israel in one day. Mind-boggling. And most of the remaining ones are going to occur during the tribulation, which means we're getting pretty much at the door. Um, why for this internal consistency and this prophetic accuracy? Well, from Second Peter, For the prophecy came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word of God is the inspired word of God. Word for word and cover to cover. And that's why we are making a big mistake when we change the word of God to fit with secular atheists' beliefs. Hmm. What about this? Isn't the Bible full of errors? Well, I always have the Skeptic Society in Arizona follow me around one year. Everywhere I spoke, even in a church service, they'd have 15 of their people in here. And um, during a Q&A one night after one of my messages, they kept hogging the Q&A. And I would, they'd ask questions, I'd answer. They'd ask questions, I'd answer. 
And the president of the Skeptic Society came one night, and he, he asked about three or four questions. I answered, and I answered, and people were getting kind of mad with him, always hogging the Q&A. And he finally, uh, I, he started to raise his hand. I said, hey, listen, I, I've answered several of your questions. Why don't you answer one of mine? You're, you're president of, oh, what's the group you're the president of? He said, Skeptic Society. I said, oh, okay, so you're, you're, uh, you're skeptical. He said, that's right, we're skeptics. I said, well, I just showed 10 frauds about Darwinism right out of the textbooks that they're teaching our children. Do you ever go into the, uh, to the biology classes and confront the professors about their lies? And he said, well, well, well no, we, we believe in evolution. <laughs> I said, oh, so you're not really the president of the skeptic society, you're, you're president of the hypocrite society, isn't that right? <laughs> and they never followed me around after that. <laughs> oh, and by the way, well, I don't have time to get into the evolution thing right now, but real science is on our side. That's all I've got time to say right now. But, uh, you know, they'll point to, saying there's errors in the Bible, Second Chronicles, where we're told that Solomon had 4,000 uh, stalls for horses and chariots in his army. But in 1 King, it says he had 40,000 stalls for horses. One says 40,000 horse stalls. The other says 4,000 horse and chariot stalls. And they say, this is an error in the Bible. It's been copied down. You can't trust the Bible anymore. Well, I'd say we just don't understand what we're being told. Solomon had 4,000 chariots in his army. Each chariot had 10 horses. That way, if a horse was killed or wounded in battle, they could just replace the horse, didn't lose the whole chariot. So he had 4,000 horse and chariot stalls. Well, each individual horse and chariot stall had 10 individual horse stalls in it. 10 horse stalls times 4,000 horse and chariot stalls is 40,000 horse stalls. No error in the Bible, just an area skeptics and scoffers just couldn't quite wrap their brain around. No, I didn't say they were stupid. I just said they couldn't wrap their brain around that. Um, couldn't God have used the Big Bang? Well, you know, it's never a good question, couldn't God have? It's, did he do what he said he did? God could do anything. He could have made this out of a fudge sickle if he wanted to, right? I don't like the big bang or the gap there. I'm more of the fudge sickle guy, okay? You know, if you're going to change things. But did you know we're on our fourth big bang? Christians come up to me all the time. And they're trying to figure out how do we fit the secular atheist beliefs in the Bible? And it caught, good, couldn't God have used the big bang? Well, which one? We're on our fourth one. Did you know that? Yeah, they don't like to talk about that. There was a hesitation model that got totally debunked and thrown out. There was a steady state model. That's what Einstein believed in. It, it was debunked and thrown out. There was the oscillating model. Now we're on the expanding model. And it's got so many problems. The, the cover story of Scientific American back in 2011 was how we need to get rid of the current one. It's got so many problems they could never fix it. But they won't get rid of it because the only other viable option is in the beginning, God created. In fact, a letter signed by dozens of scientists appeared in New Scientist magazine called Bucking the Big Bang. It included statements such as the Big Bang Theory can boast no predictions that have been validated by observation, by real science. And the theory relies on a growing number of never seen entities like inflation, dark matter, and dark energy that cannot, and the theory can't survive without these fudge factors. It said in no other branch of science would this be accepted. But see, it's not science. It's a faith-based belief on how we came about without God. Real science would have kicked it out long ago. The biggest scientific announcement in 2016 was the discovery of inflation supporting the fourth Big Bang Theory. It was all over the news for six months, misled millions and millions, probably billions of people. And then in 2017, it quietly disappeared and the scientists that <clears throat> discovered it said, actually, we never did discover any inflation. We just wanted it so bad. Total fraud. Misled billions. People say, you don't believe in the Big Bang? Well, actually, I do believe in the Big Bang. The Bible says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. That, my friends, is a Big Bang. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. And you'd better be ready for it. Well, how could God have gotten light here in six days? I hear that all the time. This is actually foretold in 2 Peter 3. This would be a question. But, um, you know, the way I usually answer that, well, I, I don't know how God could have gotten light here in six days because he got it here on the first day. 
which usually doesn't help the situation any, but <laughs> light travels about 186,282 miles per second through our atmosphere. Did you know that scientists and labs have slowed light to 100 miles per hour? They slowed it to 30 miles per hour. They brought light to a dead stop, captured it, and re-released it. Other scientists working in conjunction with Princeton were able to speed light impulses to 300 times the speed of light. My answer to the light issue is if mankind can play with the speed of light, I don't think the creator of light and the creator of the universe has any trouble getting light anywhere he wants exactly when he wants it and tells us that he did. It's our mistake when we limit God to what his creation can do. He's the creator. You ever heard this? Wasn't it just a local flood? This is trying to mix the foundation of secular atheistic beliefs into the Bible. Millions of years of time, that's their whole foundation. It's everything to them. If they lose millions of years, Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, modern atheism, agnosticism, they all collapse if they lose millions of years. That's why everything days, millions and billions of years. They're trying to indoctrinate you in their, their finding. So, People will say, well, wasn't it just a local flood? Well, let me explain how the age of the earth is derived, and you'll see the importance of the global flood. The other side understands it greatly. We, we just don't seem to get it. But Moses told us that God has judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. Now, that would be a global flood, right? Now, I, I'm going to blame this on Pastor Paul, because he told me I could be perfectly honest with you guys today. Is that okay? Can I be honest with everybody? Does anybody want me to lie? Okay, then I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay, well, let's be honest here. If God's word were really true, and there had been this flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, I mean, a global flood, wouldn't the evidence be overwhelming? I mean, I would think if there had really been this global flood, the crust of the earth that we live our entire lives on, it would have been eroded during the first 150 days of the flood, as the fountains of the deep were erupting, and it would have been stratified out by grain size, weight, and density, and then laid down in stratified layers, separated by grain size, weight, and density, so it all, all shale, all mudstone, all sandstone. They wouldn't just be one big brown conglomerate like they'd formed slowly over millions of years. They'd be stratified. You ever see a miner with a pan? He gets some sediments and water. He sloshes it back and forth. The moving water stratifies out the sediments by grain size, weight, and density. The gold, gold being the densest goes to the bottom. So what do we find today uh, on the crust of the earth? Well, the, the crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water, stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. And those layers laid down quickly in that year-long flood are full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. Exactly what would be there if the Word of God were true. And you see, my friends, the Word of God is true word for word, and cover to cover. I left my home a month ago. We were, I was speaking at a church in California. A mile down the road from my house is a raccoon. Someone run it over right in the middle of the road. Killed it, deader than a doornail. I came back four days later. Scavengers had already eaten it. I thought it was going to lay there for millions of years, waiting for strata to build up around it so it become a fossil. <laughs> Things have to be buried immediately to become fossils. Why would you call it a local flood? Follow me on this. One of the great prophecies in the New Testament, 2 Peter 3, and the whole prophecy goes 3 through 6, they'll come in the last day scoffers claiming uniform processes, and they're going to deny that uh, God made the heavens mature, oh, God couldn't get light here, and they're going to be willingly ignorant. And this is the one I want to focus on because this is secular geology today. They're going to be willingly ignorant that the world that was being overflowed with water perished. Hey, let that sink in for a second. 1,900 years ago, the Bible said in the last days, scoffers will claim uniform processes and deny the global flood. Why would they deny the flood? Because the foundation of humanism, Darwinism, naturalism, modern atheism, agnosticism, and all the isms inside the church trying to fit their foundation into the Word of God are all based on the earth's crust having formed slowly and uniformly without a global flood. A global flood explains how the earth crust formed quickly, wiping out every old earth belief that puts death before Adam. 
I'm going to talk about this in a moment. But see, the whole message of the cross, well, I'm not, let me hold on to that. We're, we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But this is why people deny the flood. Atheists deny it because it destroys their worldview. And some Christians who've been led to accept their worldview, millions of years of death and suffering before man, to try to make it work, they claim it's a local flood. So if you've been doing that, here's your chance. Drop it. Drop it. And just put your trust in the word of God, who judged the world with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. These layers, they were invented only 220 years ago, and they put death before Adam. We'll get back to that in a minute. But Jesus said, if I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? What's he saying? He's saying, if I have told you of earthly things that you can test, study, and observe, things that you walk on your entire life, things that you can hold in your hands, and you won't even believe those things, how in the world are you going to believe in spiritual things that you can't test, study, and observe? Here's my suggestion. Let's humble ourselves to the Word of God. Here's a question. There isn't enough water to cover Mount Everest. Where would all the water go? Well, that's a fair question. Mount Everest is like 29,000 plus feet above sea level. Now, if the Earth were relatively flat, the water on Earth would be two miles deep around the whole planet. But that still wouldn't cover Mount Everest today. But the mountains weren't there toward, until the very end of the flood. The Bible says the waters rush up by the mountains and down by the valleys at the end of the flood. The mountains arose and the valleys collapsed and the waters rushed back and forth, swaying back and forth against the mountains in the low areas where they've settled into the low areas today, our ocean basins. Did you know that 71% of their surface is covered by water? Only 29% is land. Now, these same scientists that say there is never a global flood on Earth We'll say there was a global flood on Mars, and we don't even know about a liquid drop of water on Mars. That's their bias. That's not science. Okay, what about this? Doesn't radiometric dating prove the rock layers are billions of years old? No. Radiometric dating techniques are not used on the sedimentary layers of rock laid down by water. There is no scientific technique of dating um, the sedimentary layers. Uh, radiometric dating techniques are used on igneous rock that was once melted. They think the process sets the age back to zero. It's ba they're based on multiple wild guesses. I cover these in our Old Earth Global Flood. And the one I've always used as an example because for the last 75 years, the most popular radiometric dating technique has been potassium argon. Potassium decays into argon. They measure the amount of argon, say it takes this long to form. They overlook the fact, what if it was contaminated with argon? What if argon was in the rock when it first formed? It's going to make, date millions and billions of years older than it is. But they've really messed up my book and everything because I use potassium argon since that's the most popular method. In the last six months, they've come out and finally admitted it doesn't work. They're not even using it anymore, and it's been their number one dating method for the last 80 years. So no, the, so they don't radiometric date the rock layers. The rock layers are dated by the fossils found in them. They date the rock layers by the fossils in them. Well, doesn't carbon dating show that fossils are millions of years old? No, carbon dating is used on organic remains, plant and animal remains. But in a, a fossil, the organic material has been replaced by silica and other minerals. It's basically a rock. There is no scientific technique to date fossils. They date the fossils by the rock layer they're in. Did you catch that? They date the fossil by the rock layer and the rock layer by the fossil. It's a total circular argument based on that man-made geologic column based on the belief the layers form slowly, not quickly, during a global flood. Do you see how the global flood wipes out every old earth belief? Wow. See, if I go on a camp, college campus and talk about Darwinism, they get mad. Woo, they get mad. But there's nothing they can do because all they have to do is give one example of Darwinian evolution have, ever having taken place. They can't do it. It never happened. All they can do is get mad. But if I talk about uh, the age of the earth, I have to have bodyguards. They understand. If they lose millions of years, they lose it all. So they date the rock by the fossil and the fossil by the rock. Well, why don't we find human fossils in older, lower strata layers? Well, keep in mind the purpose of the flood. God said, I will destroy man. When God said, I will destroy man, I think what God meant was that he would uh, <clears throat> uh, destroy man. 
Why don't we find human fossils in lower layers? Well, first of all, mammal fossils are extremely rare. They make up less than one quarter of 1% of the fossil record. 99% of any mammal fossils consist of just one bone. Human fossils, extremely, extremely rare. But keep in mind, they date the rock by the fossil and the fossil by the rock. Back in 1972, they found what they announced was a modern human skull, but it was under a rock layer, under a rock layer that had already been dated 250 million years old. Even Darwinists teach humans only came along in the last two million or less years, so the human skull was below the 250 million year layer. So did they admit these layers had to be laid down in a flood? The secular atheist belief systems totally destroyed. Did they admit that? Oh, of course not. They just redated the rock from 250 million to 1.8 million because they date the rock by the fossil and the fossil by the rock. You'll never get them to admit things are out of order, although they're out of order from top to bottom. Um, or don't the ice ages and continental drift prove the Earth is billions of years old? Well, let's talk about these. At the start of the flood, the fountains of the deep erupted. Most people think the water came from above. A little did. Most of it came from below when the fountains of the deep erupted. These were scalding hot thermal waters, and it heated the oceans. It's estimated the flood waters averaged 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You had massive evaporation and cloud cover that was raining over the equators and pounding snow onto the poles to form the ice caps. And the one and only ice age was upon the earth. Now, after the flood, the, the ice age, it lasted somewhere around 800 years. The oceans slowly started cooling and the evaporation became less and less and finally the ice age ended. And um, probably roughly 100 years or 800 years after the flood. But it was a very warm tropical climate. It wasn't cold and animals spread out and that's the reason we find buried mammoths in snow because they, they spread out and they were feeding along the edges of the ice caps where there were a lot of springs and a windstorm or snowstorm buried them suddenly. That's the reason we find intact uh, woolly mammoths today. They would be post-flood events. You know, the secular teaching is the ice ages occurred during a cooling cycle of the planet, right? Wouldn't a cooling cycle cool down the oceans? Wouldn't that end evaporation? How'd the ice get to the poles? It takes warm oceans to form clouds to bring the water to the poles. Now, this is a map of the worldwide uh, fault lines. The Earth is crisscrossed with about 50,000 miles of these fault lines. These are mostly scars left over from where, from where the fountains of the deep erupted. Like uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge goes right down the middle of the ocean, and the continents split apart along where these fissures had occurred in what we call continental drift today. It happened quickly toward the end of the flood, not slowly and uniformly at today's rate. We see them uh, rocking back and forth a half inch a year. We wouldn't even know if they're moving back and, or just going back and forth. But based on uniformity, foretold in 2 Peter 3, they say, well, they're, they're this many thousand miles apart, a half inch a year. It took hundreds of millions of years. You ever see, see a car rear in another car? I mean, in a billionth of a second, boom, the hood's crumpled. Well, let's say you'd never seen that. You believed in uniformity. You can't could come along, measure the, the amount of, that the hood is crumpling now, which is nothing, and you could come to the conclusion it took hundreds of millions of years to crumple that hood. You'd be absolutely wrong. Things happen quickly, not slowly. Well, didn't Adam's sin just bring in spiritual death, not physical death? These are, again, people trying to fit millions of years of time into God's word. Uh, spiritual death was immediate. Physical death began immediately. In fact, like a rose cut from a vine, it takes time for the process to be completed. Well, if physical death were instant, there would be no way to be redeemed with our loving creator. C.S. Lewis called pain God's megaphone to the world to call people back to him. God's being gracious. He wants no one to perish, and he's giving us time to accept our redemption through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, if physical death had been immediate, that would have been the end of mankind. It shows God's grace and mercy. Well, haven't scientists proven birds evolved from dinosaurs over millions of years? 
You know, this is now one of their, it seems like every 10 years they pick out something and then it disappears later. But, uh, so they're trying to teach that dinosaurs evolved into uh, birds. Now think about this, from, from the, let's give them, they can't get life started. The law of biogenesis, real science, life cannot start from non-life. But they, they have no way to get life started. But let's give them billions of bacteria cells or that's the end of the discussion, right? Uh, they think everything somehow overcame the law of biogenesis, and not today when you can test, study, and observe it, no longer going far away, but then everything evolved. I mean, from eagles to fish to, to all of us from this bacteria cell. Well, this would have left trillions, not millions, not billions, trillions of missing links in the fossil record. They can't show one that will hold up to scientific scrutiny, and yet they want to convince you that without finding any of the trillions that should be out there, that they do find the one between uh, reptiles and birds. What are the odds of that without finding trillions of others first? I mean, just think about it logically. All their claim feathered dinosaurs have turned out to have hair, not feathers, or to be extinct flightless birds like, think, emu. They said Compsognathus was the missing link. It was a little dinosaur about the size of a chicken, and they found, they said that was the feathered link, but a year and a half ago they found a well-preserved compsognosis that had 100% scales, zero feathers. And also real science, a believer's best friend, reptiles don't have genetic information to form feathers, which are very complex structures. And real science, a believer's best friend, knows of no way for nature to add that kind of information to a gene pool. And also, birds are found in layers below dinosaurs, which means they couldn't have evolved from the dinosaurs in their time frame anyways. I bet you guys have all heard this. Many of you have probably even said it, but aren't a day and a thousand years the same thing to God? Anyone hear someone say that or even think it? Let's make sure we straighten this out today so you can help other people. This is the only verse people trying to fit millions of years of death and suffering into God's word bring up to me. Well, a day and a thousand years are the same thing to God. That's not what that says. It says a day and a thousand years, and this comes from 2 Peter 3. Uh, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. They're not saying they're the same thing. A day to God is a day. And a thousand years to God is a thousand years. And God knows how to communicate, by the way. So I was talking about 2 Peter 3, the great prophecy, 3 through 6, about scoffers who claim uniform processes, deny God could get light here, and deny the global flood. That's what we see today. And those are verses 3, 3 through 6. So in verses 7 and 8, the answer is, well, God wants nobody to perish. So he's being, he's being patient with us. And whether he sends Jesus in a day, or he sends Jesus in a thousand years, comparing them as polar opposites, not saying they're the same thing, doesn't matter to God. He will send Jesus in his perfect timing. They're saying, where's the promise of Jesus' return? And the answer is, God will send him when he's good and ready, whether it's a day or a thousand years, comparing them as polar, do you see that? So please help other Christians, because this is the most common thing I, I hear. Well, a thousand years and a day are the same thing to God. They're not. They're, a day is a day, and a thousand years is a thousand years. Because keep back to logic. God is outside of space, matter, and time. We're locked into this space-time continuum. We live in the present. We can look to the past. We head into the future. But God's outside of all this. He can see the past. He can see the present. He can see the future all at the same time. God's outside looking down on this whole thing. And that's the reason he can make prophecies. He's already seeing it. He can look at it again today, write it down, and if he wants to, he can look at it again tomorrow. He can see the future. That's the reason the Bible makes all these hundreds and hundreds of prophecies 100% accurately. So God isn't saying a day and a thousand years are the same thing. He's saying whether I send Jesus in a day or whether I send him in a thousand years, you don't need to worry about. I'm going to send him in my perfect timing. It doesn't matter to God if it's a day or a thousand years. Hmm. Do you think intelligent life was brought here by aliens? The more I watch the news, the more I question whether or not there's intelligent life here. <laughs> Just thinking. So some people say, well, well Russ, Andromeda is the nearest major galaxy to the Milky Way. Maybe aliens came from there. It's two and a half million light years from us, and that's the closest major galaxy. 
Well, some people say, well, alien spaceships are really fast. Okay, well, let's say they could go half the speed of light. It would still take them five million years to get here. Well, maybe aliens can hibernate. Well, you know, we can go on and on with the maybes, okay? But the fact is that a cubic yard of space contains an estimated 10,000 dust particles. If you had a spaceship that was traveling half the speed of light and you hit a dust particle, it would cause an explosion equal to detonating 60 tons of TNT. And my friends, that would ruin your hibernation <laughs> in a hurry. And also, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, believes in him, should not perish. It's important to believe in God. We have to be very careful Satan is the father of lies. He's the author of confusion. He doesn't have to get us to say we're not Christians if he can get you to believe in a different Jesus. Hmm. We could talk about that for a long time. Now, that'll get me in a lot of trouble, okay? So, not, not with Pastor Paul, but I'm telling you, if you want to talk about that later, let's talk about it, because I'm here to help you. Just like I used to be a theistic evolutionist. Praise God, I, I worship this Jesus who used millions of years of death and suffering to slowly evolve us. You won't find that Jesus anywhere in the Bible. Hmm. Think about it. I hope that's just opened up some eyes here. Let's humble ourselves to the Word of God. Here's a question. This comes from someone who's trying to compromise. Should we waste our time on evolution and age of earth issues when we should be sharing the gospel? Well, both Pew and Barna Research say that we're losing almost 9 out of 10 Christian kids by the age of 20. You think it's a waste of time to stand up for the truth of God's word? No. This, this information generally gets blocked because they don't, pastors don't want to upset the old earth believers. Wow, it's an evil fruit. You tell good from bad by the fruit. In fact, uh, Pew did a research of 20 to 30-year-olds who had lost their faith but had been raised in Christian homes. The number one reason they lost their faith was thinking Darwinian evolution were true. I show people how to scientifically destroy Darwin, Darwinian evolution in four seconds flat. Would you like to hear that? Yeah. Start your watch. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism impossible. Stop your watch. Oh, I'm sorry, that was three seconds. I cover this in our science and Darwinism. There's not a single example that's ever happened. It's a scientific impossibility the only thing real science, a believer's best friend, finds is kinds bring forth after their kind. People bring forth people. Dogs bring forth dogs. You can have variation within them caused by the loss of information. That's what breeders use. They breed out information to get purebreds. They breed out gene depletion. Real science only finds kinds bring forth after their kind. Hey, for any of the kids and students in here, why is that important for Christians to understand? Because ten times in the book of Genesis, we're told plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. And today, in the year 2019, after millions of scientific experiments on this issue, the only thing that has ever been found is kinds only bring forth after their kind. And people are going, oh, Darwinian evolution proves the Bible's not true. Darwinian evolution is the biggest fairy tale and fraud in the history of the world. Yeah, one of my teachings is the top ten uh, lies of Darwinism, right out of the textbooks, and it destroys it. It's the only teaching I have on Darwinism. There's nothing to talk about after that. The number two reason the kids are leaving is being taught the Bible's not rational. Not rational compared to what? To the secular teachings. And thinking there's no proof of creation. You mean like kinds only bring forth after their kind, like the Bible says? Or maybe like that mile of sedimentary layer laid down by water that makes up the crust of the earth that wipes out every old earth belief, destroying Darwinism, naturalism, humanism, modern atheism, agnosticism, and all the compromised positions within the church today. I mean, no proof like that. Well, the proof is all over, but it gets blocked. Only 2% of churches, let me share this. 2%, while well, we lose 90% of our kids because they don't want to upset the old earth believers. So my friends, I'm not attacking anyone who's been fooled into believing in those things. I used to be. I'm here to help you. But we need to stop blocking the truth while we lose our kids. And if it steps on some toes, then we need to step on some toes. Um, and, and they think the church has no answers. So I, I lead Grand Canyon tours. And uh, I, take, I take about 1,000 people a year to the canyon. And sometimes, not often, we go to the IMAX uh, at the end of the day. And I was in the IMAX, standing in line. There's really crowded that day. There are two lines. 
And finally, I get up to the front, and there was a woman about 50 years old selling tickets. And the, the lady selling tickets next to her was a 23-year-old. And I said to the lady, she said, I said, I need 55 tickets. She said, well, what group are you with? I said, Creation Ministries. Immediately, the younger woman selling tickets just starts yelling at me in this lobby. What are you teaching those people? I looked around, I said, I'm teaching them how the Grand Canyon really formed instead of these worn-out fairy tales you guys keep pushing. She stuttered backwards, regrouped, and said something totally revealing. She said, well, 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 I was raised in a Christian home, and I went off to college and learned everything the Bible said is a lie. I said, you went off to college, listened to a bunch of atheist Marxist professors, and bought every lie they spewed out of their mouth. I said, you've been fooled. You've become a fool. I said, listen, when I give these people their tickets, I have 35 minutes. If you want to take a break, I'll sit down in the coffee shop with you and answer any question you have about creation, evolution, age, earth issues. And she did. And she asked me question after question, every one an extremely well thought out intelligent question. I'm telling you, our children and grandchildren have these questions and we're the ones blocking the answer. They're leaving thinking the church has no answers. The church has the answers. But we're so busy compromising God's word with secular atheist foundations, we can't provide the answers. Do you, do you see that? My friends, help your fellow Christians. First, we need to stop the compromise, and we need to start standing on the truth, even if it goes against the non-biblical beliefs we've accepted. We need to humble ourselves God. You know, if you came in here today worshiping a, a, a different Jesus, uh, you know, when the disciples asked Jesus what would be the signs of the last days right before his turn, you know what the first thing he said was? False Christs. Hmm. The church of Laodicea, the last days church, Jesus has the angel introduce him as the creator. And where's Jesus? Well, the angel is saying, hey, your creator's here. He's standing outside knocking, saying, hey, let me back in. Let's let him in, okay? Anyone with me on that? Hey, listen, I understand people being misled. I actually don't understand why everybody's not misled. Aren't you paying attention to what the secularists are teaching? So I understand that, but get some help. Don't walk off mad. Just... Realize, I used to be a theistic evolutionist. See, I didn't get mad. Some people get mad. I didn't get mad. Oh, I got mad at the secular side for teaching it. But think about what this Darwinian biologist from Harvard and world-renowned atheist speaker said. Think about this. The revolution against Christianity began when it became obvious Earth was ancient rather than having been created 6,000 years ago. He said, this finding, the old Earth beliefs were the snowball that started the whole avalanche that has wiped Christianity off the face of the map in Europe and is doing the same thing here. You know, we teach our kids that they evolved without God, that there's no creator. Don't our freedoms come from the fact we're endowed by our creator? You look around and say, what in the world's going on with this nation? That, there's your answer right there. We need to stop the compromise. And, my friends, Satan is really good at what he does. No wonder Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. At my college, it's okay to belittle Christians, but you say anything unflattering about anyone else, you'll be expelled. Why is this? I was speaking on a college campus a couple years ago, and I do the hour-long uh, presentation, then I have to do an hour-long open Q&A. Otherwise, if I just left, the professor would say, oh, boy, if I could have spoken, no, I've got to let them have their shot because... I want the kids to see they've got nothing. They can close the classroom door, but they can't stand up to truth. And we're doing the Q&A, and one, guy, one kid stands up, and he, he just says something putrid about Christians. And the whole auditorium just roared in laughter. And God just gave this to me as I was standing there. And I waited for the laughter to die down. And I said, now I have a question for all of you. If this young man would have said something like that about a Hindu or a Muslim, a New Ager or a homosexual, he would have been kicked out of this school. But you, he said something like that about a Christian, and you guys thought that was so enjoyable, so funny. Why is that? You could have heard a pin drop. And I'm having this conversation in my head with God, and I'm saying, but God, they're going to they're gonna kill me if I say this. <laughs> and that's what he told me to say. I said, okay, I'll tell you what, let me, let me answer that question for all of you. You see, Satan is the God of this world and the God of this secular campus, and he already has all non-believers. He doesn't want you wasting your time attacking non-believers, 
but Christianity is the real deal. And that's why on this campus, you cannot say boo to anybody, but you can say any putrid thing you want about Christians, and you'll all think it's so great because Jesus Christ is the real thing, and Satan hates it. You could have heard a pin drop, and they didn't kill me. I thought that was kind of a nice bonus. <laughs> we did have to leave by the back door that night, but that's another. You can, you can talk to my wife about that. Um, how can you possibly explain a loving God in this world full of death? You, get, you guys ever hear that before? Yeah. Maybe you've had that thought yourself when something bad happens. How can we have a loving God in a world full of death and suffering? If you leave here with nothing else today, know how to biblically answer this question. It's been lost because of old earth beliefs that put death before Adam. It's a very simple answer. It's right there in Genesis 1 and 3. And the answer is this. God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. Well, what in the world happened to it? Adam's original sin. You see, Adam's original sin corrupted the creation, allowing death to enter. And that's why we live in a world full of death today, but have a loving creator. Pretty simple, isn't it? That's the biblical answer. If you put death before Adam, old earth beliefs, you can't teach Adam's sin brought death in the world. See that? Yeah. Now, how loving is that God? Well, the original sin is more important from a Christian standpoint because Adam walked in the garden with God, but we don't walk in the garden with God because that sin separated us from God, requiring that we be redeemed with him. Well, we've, we've got a problem there. There's nothing you and I can do to redeem ourselves with God. We can't be that righteous, that perfect. God is so loving, though, despite our sin that corrupted his creation, he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross so that all of us sinners, by accepting his sacrifice and believing in him, all he asks is we believe in him, can be redeemed with him forever. That's a loving God. Next time somebody asks you, answer and lead them right to the gospel message. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed when Jesus returns is death. In fact, we're told I saw a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, where the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the lion will eat straw like the ox. We're going back to that perfect world. My friends, we need to earnestly contend for the faith. We're given our marching orders. Some people say, I just never have felt called. Read the Bible. We're all told. Pray continually. Spread the word and contend for the faith. We've all got a specific calling. The purpose of our ministry is to teach about creation, evolution, age of the earth issues, to challenge people about where they've been tweaked off that narrow pathway onto the broad path, and to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. You know, we do this for our various teachings. You ever heard, heard that you're 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? Anyone ever hear that? You know, real science, a believer's best friend, has a 30% difference. Not a 2%, a 30% difference. Hey, did you know your biochemistry is 96% the same as that from a mouse? It's 50% the same as that from a banana. Anyone of all from a banana? Just two people, Pastor. Last time I was on a college campus, 500 students raised their hand because they've been taught we all evolved from common ancestors. That would mean we're related to bananas. I checked my family tree. There wasn't a banana in the whole bunch. <laughs> oh, didn't find that very appealing, hey? <laughs> oh, we're just, we're going to split. I, I never heard that. We're going to split. Oh, that's good. <laughs> but my friends, you can check out our DVDs out here. Uh, I don't copyright my DVDs. I tell you, hey, if you get my DVDs, DVDs, make a million copies. A woman in Washington got our DVD set about 10 years ago, went out and bought a tower copier. She's given out over 500 complete sets. I've had 12 uh, churches uh, bring me in. Uh, I spoke in the science auditorium one night at Eastern Oregon University. I spoke in three public high schools last year in Oregon because of this woman's um, effort. We can make a difference, my friends. My book, The Costs, Covers top 10 Darwinian beliefs, top 10 Old Earth beliefs, top 10 reasons you can believe in, uh, in creation and the flood. And I have uh, kids coloring books with lots of information in there about dinosaurs and our Christian heritage. You guys know in the last 15 years, more than 50 non-fossilized dinosaur bones have been found that still have red blood cells, amino acids, and soft, flexible dinosaur tissue in them. 
Why isn't that all over the front page news? Because dinosaurs are one of their pillars of millions of years away. 65 million years ago, whoops. Now they're going, gee, we didn't know these biological materials could last 65 million years. <laughs> That's bias, not science. My friends, thank you for letting me speak. I hope the information will be a blessing to many. And Pastor Paul, thank you for having me here. I appreciate the chance to share.